बोले सोनिहाल दे हशिवा बर मोह है शुभ कर मन ते कब न टरो Um, dear honorary secretary, dear principals, dear honor, uh, honorable guests, um, to start off with the end of the talk, we've just heard uh, the announcements regarding um, the quest for UNESCO World Heritage for this honorable college. Well, there is a chance that we indeed can do something because. Um, it is a coincidence, or perhaps it's not a coincidence, um, that at, the at this very time, UNESCO considers the war cemeteries of the First World War, of which there are more than 150 in my province, considers them to be listed on UNESCO World Heritage List. And we have already received the support of the Indian ambassador to UNESCO in Paris to do so. So, I would say, isn't this a clear example of a quid pro quo? And I could go to Belgian ambassador, to UNESCO, and say, well, Indian ambassador supports Belgium's request for the war cemeteries to be listed. So, I think it's honorable and just if Belgian ambassador supports Indian request for Casa College to be inscribed on the uh, world. Um, and it would be it would be more than right for, as you have already heard from the, from the introductions, um, I will mainly focus on the First World War and on what happened in my region. I live in Flanders, which is the northern part of Belgium, where our mother tongue is Dutch. And in the First World War, uh, for four years there was fighting around my town, and for four years uh, there was an Indian presence mainly see presence in the first year of the war, in the very beginning. And um, I brought you some slides, some, I made a PowerPoint. Um, can you just go back to the first slide, please? Um, the title I've given is Sikhs in the Salient. Now, what is the Salient? Uh, the town I come from, and in which my museum is based, um, is called Ypres, Y-P-R-E-S. And um, in the first world war, the front line ran at the same time to the north, to the east, and to the south of the town. Which means that if you were in the town, you could be shot at from three sides. And that's what they call a salient. Hence my title, Six in the Salient. And you see a very wonderful uh, propaganda photograph, uh, photograph image, published by the French, but expressing, expressing cultural solidarity. You see to the left, you see a Belgian soldier. To the right, you see a West African soldier fighting for the French, and in the middle, you see a wounded Sikh, and the two others are taking care of him. Um, and it's set in the dunes, so on the Belgian coast. And it's a clear image, it dates from 1914, and it's a clear image that already at that time, it was sensed as a kind of multinational, multicultural solidarity against the common invader being uh, Germany. Next slide, please. Um, another sense in which this uh, solidarity, but from another kind, another type, was uh, expressed is this postcard, um, which was of course published by the British. And it's no coincidence that the Indian soldier the British took for this uh, propaganda card was a Sikh, um, because Sikhs, the La it was mainly it was the Lahore division, the Lahore division that was sent to Europe, and in the Lahore division. Uh, many of the regiments were Sikh regiments, hence the, um, this propaganda postcard. Next slide, please. And from the very, very, it's, it's one of the remarkable things that I have to stress is that war broke out on the 4th of August 1914, and already on the 6th of August 1914, the government 
of India was acknowledged and decided to send over troops. But at first, the troops were meant to go to Egypt to guard the Suez Canal. But when the Lahore Division arrived in Egypt, the British army was in peril. And you won't find this very often in British historiography. But British army then was a very small, very small professional army. And in the first battles, they were decimated. So they needed every hand to stop the Germans during the invasion of Belgium. Belgium. And that's why they called on the Indian troops to move on from Egypt to France. When they arrived in France, um, they were hailed by the inhabitants. This is a photograph of when they just arrived in Marseille, in the port, in the port in the south of France, um, and they are parading the town. And um, you might read the, um, the caption on the needs. Um, and I think they are there to chase the German hooligans, it says. So again, it's a propaganda postcard, and the photograph is of the arriving in Marseille and being hailed as liberators. So they were really seen as liberators. And again, I stress, they were there from very early in the war. Already end of September 1914, they arrived. So they didn't hesitate when the call came. Um, again, my symbol of the popularity of the six soldiers is uh, you see a French lady and she's pinning a flower on the chest of uh, the officer to the left. Now, this is also a very important aspect because um, there is a direct link between the Sikh and Broder. And... Is that? Yeah? Okay. Um, there's a, there is a direct link between the Sikh and more broader the Indian involvement in the, on the Western Front in Europe in the First World War and the struggle for Indian independence. Because when the Sikhs are over in Europe, they are there in 1914-15, they will be billeted with local people. And these local people will be very friendly to them. And they will accommodate them. There is one letter survived of a Sikh soldier who wrote to his family. And he's saying, well, I'm staying in the house of, um, it was just across the border, with a French widow. Um, she has lost her son in the war. But now um, I'm staying in the house and she's treating me like I am her lost son. So you see, this was a completely different way. This was a completely different way of um, meeting, I would say, white people, European people, than they would have met the British overlords here in India. Um, they would see that there were Europeans who would treat them on a more equal footing than the British would do. So it would change their view. They would more realize that the way they were treated by the British. So it had a very direct cultural influence on um, these soldiers. Um, this is a photograph already, again, very early in the war of um, um, Sikh Soar in West of October uh, 1914. What is important to stress is because they were brought in hastily, because they were brought in hastily, they were still in their summer gear. So they were wearing a summer uniform. Now, I can tell you when I left on Thursday morning and I left home, it was 6 degrees Celsius and spring was starting. It was early in the morning, but even during daytime, it will not be more than 15 degrees. These men are there in October. October is autumn. Um, it would be dreadfully cold, it would rain. Still, they only had their summer gear, so they must have suffered. We can only try to imagine how they must have suffered um, in that time. Moreover, there is a second problem, that is that due to the first war of independence, Indian, first war of Indian, the Indian mutiny as it was called, uh, since the Indian mutiny, Indian military personnel was kept one generation behind regarding firearms. So the Indian troops, including the Sikhs, they were trained in using older rifles than the British troops would use. And when they arrived, when they arrived, they were given the, these new rifles, but they had never learned to fight with them. So they were lacking behind training. They had to train themselves very quickly before they could make it to the front line. It was not an advantage for the Sikh troops, but actually for all the Indian troops, to go to fight in the First World War, as they did, did not have weapons that were up to scratch. Only at the moment they would go into the trenches. Um, this weaponry was made up to scratch. Um, again, 
very interesting photograph. Um, you see uh, these are not six, but these are amongst the very first. There was another company of the fifth, uh, fifth seventh wireless rifles, so were a seed company, but I don't have a photograph of them. Great start October 1914. Well, the trenches, the trenches then were very primitive. This is the beginning of the war. There's hardly any destruction. You can see in the back of the photograph, you can even see local people standing by. So this photograph was taken at the very end of October 1914, actually on the day itself of their first engagement in Europe. It would be the first engagement ever of Indian troops in Europe. And on that 31st of October 1914, Yeah, we would also have the first um, Sikh martyrs um, who fell. Now what is very interesting is, um, you see the houses on the back of this photograph? Well, some time ago I went there and if I can have the next slide. Well, you see the same row of houses over there. So this is exactly the same spot. Um, and I, I have had the honor the last year to go twice, to go twice with um, Indian TV. Uh, people to that spot, showing the old photograph, showing the new photograph. So it's the houses on the right are not existing then, and that's where they would have the trench looking down to the valley to the right, and hands over to uh, the German enemy. Next photograph, please. Now I already explained to you um, the concept of um, the salient, but that's what you clearly see um, see over here. This is what you call a salient. Um, this shows the battlefields where the Sikhs were engaged in October, beginning of November 1914. Now, what I want to point out is that you don't see a strict line. You see a dot here, a little line there, another line there, another line there. Um, and that is because the trenches were not solid. That it was not one line of trenches. You only had parts here, parts there. And that um, made the task for the Sikhs very difficult. Um, and they hadn't been they hadn't been taught the uniforms of French and of Germans. Well, the French were allies, the Germans were the enemy, and that caused problems during the night. Um, they couldn't discern blue. They would say, well, the French have a blue uniform, the Germans have a grey uniform, but in in dark you can't see the difference. Um, and hence, because it wasn't strict, right? German troops were able to infiltrate um, during the blindness. There's one particular story of a certain Gagna Singh, who uh, was all of a sudden, his section was completely surrounded by German troops, and they started fighting with the bayonets, and his bayonet broke, and then he took a sword from one of the um, dead German officers, and he kept fighting on, and he was the last of his section to remain alive. And then he was very heavily wounded, he fainted, he fainted. Um, soon after, British troops were able to recover this area and they found him alive. So he survived, he was then later on decorated with the Indian Order of Merit by King George V. And this is just one of many of heroic stories uh, from that period. Next slide, please. Well, I already told you about the misery they would have encountered in the trenches. Well, this is a more established trench winter 1914-1915, but if you look at the situation they are in, um, well, this is very, very muddy. Um, in winter time, it very often gets below zero uh, where we live. Um, they might have already got um, blue jackets, but still, still the gear wasn't sufficient. And a very recurring problem, for instance, was what they call trench feet. Now the trenches in the First World War were very muddy. And if you were standing four days and four nights, because that was the room, four days and four nights in the trenches, if you were standing four days and four nights, nights with your feet in a trench, your feet start to rot. And that's what they called trench feet. And um, many, many soldiers, including the Sikhs, would of course suffer from this new disease. And many lost their feet because of the circumstances in the trenches. Next slide, please. Um, most of the front line held by the Indians after October, November 1914 is just on the other side. My town is near the border, but it's, you can compare it to Amritsar. We're very near to the border of Pakistan, and we are very near to the border 
bit even less so than here to Pakistan. We are from the French border. And on the other side of the French border was the main Indian sector in Neuchâtel. Um, and you can see that even maps were made with uh, the names. So this is the German side, this is the Indian side. You can see the two front lines and no man's land in between. And you can see that even the names of the villages have been translated in the native languages of uh, the different Indian troops. Um, they, would mainly, they would fight uh, in March 1915 the Battle of Neuchâtel, which was the first major offensive launched by the British Empire during the First World War. First major British offensive, I stress the word, but then that's how you would find it in most history books. But then if you look at it, well, for 75% it was Indian troops who fought that uh, battle. Next slide, please. And then we come to what has already been mentioned. Um, when I, this morning I visited Golden Temple, and I was in um, and just testify, I was in the Palidar building, and I saw the date, the date was marked. And it's 27 of April, 2015. And it made me, I became very weak, because it reminded me, I hadn't realized the date, but it reminded me that today we are exactly 100 years ago, exactly 100 years ago, several hundred Sikhs were killed in my area. Um, so, and now I have the chance to talk to you on this subject exactly 100 years later. Now, what actually happened is, you see the town of Iker here, and the front line runs to all sides, so we're focusing on the north. And on 22nd of April 1915, 22nd of April 1915, something very important happened. And that's the thing we have been commemorating in New Delhi. Um, what happened was the first chemical attack ever in world history. And it's much more important than you would think it is, because it's also the first use of a weapon of mass destruction. And chemical attack took then, at that time, it was large gas cylinders, they will be opened by the Germans, and then you had a cloud of chlorine, and, they would, and that would kill all the soldiers on the other side. 22nd of April, the soldiers on the other side were mainly French. We do not have good witness accounts, because they were all killed, gas masks were not existent then. And then the result is, military result, is that you have a big gap in the line. The Germans, for one or another reason, did not exploit that gap. They just moved closer to the town, but there was no breakthrough. But you still have a gap in the line. Now what happened then, what happened then is that the British, though present in Ypres, would not use their troops to plug the gap. They would call on, call on the Indian troops from the other side of the border to plug that gap. So there was a forced march of 24 hours from La Chapelle on the French side to Ypres. When it was raining, you know, the cobblestones, or three story cobblestones, were slippery. Um, there were some direct hits by artillery. And when the Indian troops arrived, they assembled just to the north of the town here. They were given, there was a preliminary bombardment of half an hour, not more. There was no air reconnaissance, though there were German airplanes in the air, so it means the Germans knew exactly what was going on, but the Indians didn't know what was going on. And without knowing the new position of the Indians, they were uh, the new position of the Germans, um, all the Indian troops, the Lahore Division, had to attack. And of course it was a big inferno. Um, can I have the next slide please? because this is the battlefield of where this uh, happened. And um, it's taken more or less from the jump off line of the Indian troops of the Sikh regiments. And you first have to go, it's rather flat countryside, but not entirely flat. So first you have to go several hundred meters upward, and then you disappear behind the horizon, and you go several tens of meters down the road, and the Germans actually took position on the other side. So what would happen is you would see these regiments disappearing above the horizon, they would arrive in the valley, and then there was the carnage. Carnage, mainly artillery, but at a certain moment when Sikh regiments arrived on the German front line, the Germans reopened 
the gas cylinders. And so tens, we do not know exactly how many, but tens of Sikh soldiers were then killed through gas. First time Indian Army encountered chemical warfare, encountered industrial warfare. So again, a very, very important moment. And moreover, as I stressed in the beginning, this is for me, this is for me, the clearest case, the clearest example I know of colonial troops being used as cannon fodder. Because what we see is in, the British didn't use their British troops, the French didn't use their French troops, British brought in the Indians, the French brought in North African troops to plug the gap. And once the gap was plugged, they brought in their troops. So it's the clearest example I know of colonial troops being used as cannon fodder. Uh, next slide, please. This is taken in the, in the same period. Um, you see Sikh soldiers, Sikh warriors bathing and washing their clothes next to a brook because there's not only the fighting, but they would live, as I already tell, told you, they would live amongst the locals. Um, again, just like the former photo the same spot, uh, if I go to the next photograph, this is the same place where the old photograph uh, was taken. And you still have a souvenir of the Sikh presence, because if I can, if we can have the next slide, please. Um, there is a farm next to that place where the Sikhs washed and bathed. Um, the, the camp, their camp was built around that farm. Um, you have, it's not the same farm, but you have a farm here where you see um, Sikhs and I don't know whether this, it's a whole series of photographs. But you see that in one of the farm, in one of the barns, they have built a gurdwara. They're performing kirtan, but they're also exchanging gifts to local children. You see local boy here, local boy there. So they were really living together. And it would be really a mutual encounter. And if you go to that farm today, the son still remembers the story of his father. The son is now an old man, but he remembers the story of his father living amongst the Sikhs. So you still have stories amongst the local people of the time when um, Sikhs were living there. Next slide, please. Living and getting wounded and dying. Um, those who got wounded, this photograph, they were treated by uh, nurses and doctors, usually of, there were some Indian doctors, most of them were British, French, Belgian, um, and then they were brought first to a hospital, field hospital in Belgium, and then off to a large hospital in Brighton, England. So also in Brighton, England, you have uh, memorial spaces, memorial places, memorial sites for seats in Europe. And please. And this was the palace um, in Oriental style. Palace of Oriental style, once of King George IV. And it's this palace that they used as the hospital. And um, I know that there was a bond between this college and Maharaja of Patiala. Well, Maharaja of Patiala, after the war, paid for a large gate to be made to these grounds here, to the entrance grounds of um, the Brighton Pavilion. And it's that gate that serves as the main war memorial to the Indians in Brighton, England. But all those who were treated there were wounded in France and Belgium. Next slide, please. This is a good photograph of the patients there. Well, again, to stress the, the, the difference between treatments um, by the colonial overlords, the British, and by um, other Europeans such as French and Belgians. Now, they took these nice, they gave this nice palace to um, the Indian wounded, they took these nice photographs of Sikh wounded, but don't get fooled because the Sikh and the other Indians were not allowed, were not allowed to go out in town. They were completely segregated from the local population because the British overlords thought that it wasn't a good idea to see Sikh warriors intermingle with local ladies to have exchanges with local people. They wanted to keep them apart um, from locals. So the main experience of European lifestyle, the main experience of Europeans they would have near the front line rather than in England. Next slide, please. And then at the end of the main
is probably my fault. I keep kicking uh, the electricity. Um, the beginning of the end of the presence of the main infantry units, not of all troops, but of the main infantry units, uh, came in September 1915. Um, so still in the first year of the war. Um, this is a photograph taken then. And I've deliberately copied the caption. And if you will see the caption, it's in French. It reads, Have Fonterie Anglaise. And Have Fonterie Anglaise, if you translate, means English Infantry. Um, and in French it says, English Infantry ready to go through a gas attack. Well, if you look at the English Infantry, you can see that they're actually wearing turbans. Some wearing the turban underneath the gas hood, some on top of the gas hood. Um, this is the gas mask that was introduced in the summer of 1915. For when the gas was introduced in April 15, there was no gas mask, so immediately they had to start searching for protection. This photograph was taken around 25th of September 15, the Battle of Luz, again just across the French border, in which again the whole Indian Army Corps, including the Sikh regiments, took part. Um, by then they were, quite frankly, nearly completely decimated. Just to give you one example, just to give you one example, again, 27th of April, 1915. Um, it's an example I know very well, and I'll show you a photograph that has connection with it later on. 47th Sikh Regiment. Initially, in the beginning of the war, 750 men. By April 1915, there were 444 left. And these 444 men went into battle on the 27th of April 1915. At night time, when there was a call and there was a parade, they saw that 347 out of the 444 had not returned. So we have a loss there of 78%. Nearly 80% of those who went into battle were completely lost. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, after September 15, the main Sikh regiments, infantry regiments, they left. They left for Mesopotamia. Um, but you still had occasional visitors. And uh, maybe some of you um, recognize this important visitor here. I have seen him just an hour ago on some of the photographs here in college. Um, this is Bhupinder Singh, Maharaj of Patiala, and he's visiting the Belgian front. And this is a British officer. This is a Belgian officer, this is a Belgian officer, um, and so on. So um, you have regularly Indian, even Sikh, visits to the front. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, yeah, I've already shown this. Yeah. When they were in Europe, Sikhs, very proud of their identity, and rightfully so, would retain their identity. So all of the objects we unfortunately don't have in the museum, which, which I have seen in the USA, is, for instance, uh, a Guru Granth Sahib, small and in a particular shrine. And that was taken to the front line in the First World War. Um, I told you of um, you would see Sikhs performing their uh, religious um, obediences. It's something that we see here. They're singing while others are bathing in the background and all on a Belgian farmyard. And so uh, here they're performing singing Kirtan. Um, and that's all just behind the front line in the First World War. Um, they're actually amazing photographs um, showing daily life. And if I wouldn't say you it is at only a, kilo, a couple of kilometers from the front line, you would probably not be. Um, and then comes the end of the war. And these have no focus on what happened in my area. I come from. But of course, when they left Flanders and France in 1915, they would go to Mesopotamia, they would go to uh, the, uh, what is now Palestine and Israel, they would go to East Africa, they would keep on fighting. So they go to four years of fighting, and then they return to India. They return to India in 1919. And they arrive here, they have served already the British for four years, and then um, the other place I visited this morning, you have the Amritsar massacre um, that is happening. And of course, these 
six soldiers, they were saying, okay, we were told and we were convinced we were fighting the war for freedom and democracy. Because they told us that we were going to liberate Belgium and we helped liberating Belgium, but what about our freedom? So again, it had not only a cultural influence, but it also had a political influence, influence of on returning veterans. Um, at the same time, at the same time, you see that India is present, the photograph here, India is present at the Paris Peace Conference, as with a, a, a status of itself. Right? So for the first time you see that India, as India is present on a uh, conference, but there's a big, very big uh, contradiction in 1919 uh, between the words uttered by the British and the deeds done by the British. And these photographs show that perfectly because he is the um, Indian representative at the Paris Peace Street and it's during the conference that the massacre is happening. Next slide, please. Now, regarding commemoration, um, this building, the Mandate, lists the names of 55,000 British soldiers who perished in my hometown in Ypres and who have no known grave. Um, so those who were not buried or not on the Notre memorial, their names are inscribed there. And um, it's that building corresponds, many of the names would be the same names you would find on India Gate. Yeah, on India Gate is also dedicated to the memory of those who died in the First World War, states France and France, so some of the names are the same. And uh, here you have some of the um, Sikh names. And I think, but I can't see it from here, this is the panel with 47 Sikh. Um, or I might have another photo. Can I have the next photo? Yeah, please. Yeah, here. This, for instance, is a panel of 47 Sikhs, and there's something else I want to point out. I just told you about 47 Sikhs that out of 444, 347 did not come back. Well, have a look at the panel, that's the memorial. This was just before it was inaugurated in 1927, and just count the names of 47 Sikhs here. I can count only 15. 15 out of the 347 who died, which means that there are 330 of whom we do not know the name, or we might find the name, but they are not honored on the base, they are honored. So it's very difficult to say very precise how many were killed, how many were died, because the official memorials are not precise enough. And this is actually the memorial that is still the focal point of um, when we have, for instance, Armistice Day celebration. And I have the uh, next slide, please. Um, another memorial is the Neuf Chapelle Memorial. Um, just across, this has the names of 5,000 5, Indian soldiers, including many Sikhs, who died in Belgium and in France. All the names are the ones on the Middle East, so they are complementary. And um, just some words to round up on how this all started, how my involvement started, how Kupinder Singh Holland's involvement started. It was a coincidence. I went to the museum and I started working there in 1998 and I saw a tall Sikh man watching the photograph I've just shown you of Maharaja Bhupinder Singh of Kajala visiting the Belgian front. And I started talking to him and I say, oh, say I have the same name, eh? Bhupinder Singh, and I'm also Bhupinder Singh. We started talking and he said, he said, well, I'm coming here because this is the only place in Belgium in, and in Holland, because he lives in Holland, this is the only place where your history and my history meet, and we should do something together. And then the first thing we did, because this was 1998, was we organized the event um, beginning of April 1999 to commemorate the 300th anniversary of birth of Khalsa. One of the things we did is we built a temporary Gurdwara in the main, actually this is now part of my museum. And then my museum was only half of that building, and in the other half, we had a temporary Gurdwara, Guru Gurat Sahib, was read out, we had a langar underneath. And for many people in Ypres, and in my part of Flanders, where there were very few Sikhs living, this was their first encounter ever with Sikhism. And they would be very curious, and there were people out inviting them in. Um, and it's, it's a very good example of what you can do with history. I mean, I'm a historian, but history has to have a meaning. One of the meanings can be 
history offers opportunities to meet. If you have a common history, it offers opportunities to meet. And history has a sense if you work for the future. And again, if you meet together, now we have large sick communities in Holland, in Belgium, in France. Uh, we commemorate together. So it is building a new community with two different communities together. And that's actually uh, the most important thing, I think, about my work. Um, next slide, please. So you have the Panchukiaris parading from the building at the end. This is my museum where there was a temporary boudoir. As you can see, it was raining terribly. So these great men paraded with hundreds of Sikhs all over Europe to the main gate, to that main memorial, to have a special ceremony. Next slide, please. Um, that's a special minute ceremony we had, uh, pretty much televised. Um, this is also um, the last post ceremony, and this is the Sikh version of it. This is also the only daily ceremony in the world commemorating the First World War. We have many ceremonies commemorating the First World War, but this one goes on every day. And of course, they're not every day Sikhs, but every day they are honoring the Sikhs who are inscribed on the same walls. Next slide, please. And um, another thing we did in 1999 was unveiling this monument. Again, you see the Panchukyaris standing there. This monument on the spot where Indian troops, not only Sikh troops, and it's something I will always remember is, this was erected by the city of Ypres and the museum with Sikh community in Belgium and Holland. The Sikh community said, no, but we should do this for all involved all those who were part of the Indian army. So we had not only um, Sikh representatives, but also Muslim representatives, or Hindu representatives present as well. Next slide, please. And this is a view of the memorial as it looks now. So this is a date from 1999. Uh, you can see the invocation on top. We're all familiar with. Um, and then here you can't see the panel. This just says this is the spot where Indian troops entered the battlefield in Europe for the first time and then the date. And this is also uh, maintained by Sikhs in Europe. So again, very often flowers are being laid and um, it's very often visited. Um, next slide please, as you can see from this photograph. And the man you see here, uh, that's Arjinder Singh, um, and he's actually Dutch. He's a Dutch man. I met, he converted to Sikhism and he has lived many years in Amritsar. So I was already quite familiar with Amritsar because of his sorry, his stories. Next slide please. And it's an ongoing thing. Um, I have done three exhibitions since, but the main, as you can see from this photograph, every year on the 11th of November, which is Armistice Day, every day on the 11th of November, still 106 from all over Europe come to honor those who were killed in the First World War um, in Belgium. And it's something we are all very proud of. Um, the six living in Europe are very proud of. Definitely, I am very proud of that. Uh, it it's, might sound a bit stupid, but because of the turban, they are very much, very often photographed. And they are very often filmed. And each time when there is an Armistice Day celebration, and very often you have very high official visits, three times Queen Elizabeth of England has been there, French President has been there, and each time television also focuses on the Sikhs who are present. So it's actually, I always say with a smile, it's thanks to the turban that you are so visible, that the Sikhs are so visible during these uh, official commemorations. Next slide, please. And that was it. I mean, it is. An ongoing, it is an ongoing thing. Um, it started in 99, but we should not forget. We should not forget that for 80 years, for 80 years, the presence of Sikh soldiers in the First World War was almost completely forgotten. Um, and it's only to uh, the efforts of individu individuals, both from Sikh community and uh, from local communities of Belgium, France. Uh, Holland and, and, and England, that official historiography is beginning to follow. Uh, same thing in India. Um, for many decades it was nearly forgotten that um, Indian soldiers in the most general sense took part in the First World War. Um, it has now started to commemorate. I think it's something that has to evolve 
and still work for the future to involve um, remembrance of all those, all those who killed in the First World War, including and certainly also the sea soldiers. It's one of my daily duties and it's something I will continue for uh, probably the rest of my life. Thank you. With the unrelenting support of Sadar Sadar Singh Majitia, the President, Khatsa College Governing Council, the Honorary Secretary Sadar Jinder Mohan Singh Jichina has been making relentless efforts in strengthening the education system through Khalsa Institutes. Sadar Jinder Mohan Singh Jichina also holds many prestigious positions in different capacities. He is the patron Thakur Singh National Art Gallery Amritsar, the patron Punjab Cultural Promotion Council, the chairman Punjab State Small Scale Industries and Export Corporation. So the Arjunder Mohan Singh Ji China has opened up new vistas in the field of science and technology and has promoted the use of technology in teaching learning process. Under his worship, Khalsa Institutes have not only grown up quantitatively but also qualitatively and have come up on the world map. So the Arjunder Mohan Singh China has also played a pivotal role in preserving and promoting Punjabi culture and in rejuvenating Sikh values among students. In true sense, Sadar Jinder Mohan Singh Ji China is an epitome of honesty, commitment and dedication. We feel honored that he has graced the occasion by sparing his valuable time. I request Sadar Jinder Mohan Singh Ji China to give his presidential remarks. Our very special guest today, Mr. Dominic Ben Moon historian, writer, researcher, and curator from Belgium, principal of Khalsa College, Dr. Mahal Singh, principal of this prestigious institution, Dr. J.S. Dillon, Sadhvinda Singh China, Sarabji Singh China, and Sarabji Singh Gupta, and dear students. It's a, indeed a special moment as we just listened to Dr. Dominic who gave a valuable input on the role of Sikhs in the world, world wars, how the Sikhs as part of Great British India then played a role of valor and bravery in the world wars around the globe and especially in Europe. We all have read in the history the sacrifices that the Sikhs made during the Battle of Gallipoli, approximately 1.2 million Indians volunteered to fight for the British Indian Army in World War I, making them the largest volunteer army in the Great War, while six only make up 2% of India's population, 22% of the British Indian Army were six. In World War I and World War II, 83,056 were killed and 1,9,000 4,500 fighting for the Allied forces. This is the great contribution and six are a martial race and we are proud on our past and we must thank scholar Mr. Dominic who have taken pains to record the facts relating the contribution of the six in wars which were meant to restore democratic traditions, freedom of speech in this world. Indeed, we are thankful, Mr. Dominic, what you have told us, we never knew it. It is the addition in our knowledge that you have told us many things that we don't know. I know the Belgium, you know in my family, I have a gun, Belgium was famous in making guns. After World War II, my father has purchased an automatic gun, 12 more. That I have to be, that is our you know, traditional and uh, uh, family's gun, you can say. Beautiful gun. That is the automatic gun with the five cartridges. That is Belgium made. Still, I have that and that will be continued by that. One thing that my grandfather's brother, he went in the first world war in Europe. He fought there, and 91 persons from my uh, village. 
they have laid down their lives in first world war. Even the there is a stone that is laid down in the uh, primary school of our village that 91 persons have laid down the, their lives in first world war or from this village. And the brother of my great grandfather, he also went there to fought there and he came back. After that he left the uh, services. But mouth to mouth, there was one story that I want to relate to. तुसी भी बड़े बच्चे थके हो गए तो फिर जी सोच लोगे मैं बैठे हैं मेरे बच्चे चाहे उठाए बैठे हुए हैं मेरे काचे की स्टोरी सीखी तुसे हाँ वो जॉब सो के क्योंकि जब मैं उन्हीं सुनाऊंगा तो शायद पूरी तरह अपनी समझ पाओगे ना समझ पाओगे ये औरतें किसे मानों ज़्यादा कला सुनाने से इराक में � वो कहते हैं जी मेरे इस लाल सोचने से कैसे देखें कि हम जा रहे हैं बड़े छोटे में तो उन्हें बच्चे का लंबा लड़का वो लाल लाल हिंगला दे प्रॉपर तो ऑर्डर सेट नहीं दे रहे थे इतने दूर की नजर में क्या सोचो कि दूर पे दूरों देखें कि हम जा छोटे चीज की लाता जी कितने इंसान तो ऑर्डर कितने � अठारह मुसल लड़का सी ना तो उत्तर कुंड में गए थे, उन्हें वर्ग का काला, उन्हें वर्ग का तो वो लाल बोल रहे थे, वो कह रहे थे बच्चे लाके भी है कि गले में ये कैसा होगी, वो हिमला से छोड़ रहे हो तोड़ देंगे, हिमला में चले गए अल्टीमेट बोथ में लड़के हैं, लड़का गिरा और वो हिमलों में वो लड़के उसे केयर लिया वो क्या किया वो बहुत सेमी आया डर आया ऐसे और वो भी हिरना मांगो बोल रहे थे हिरना जितना हिरना वाला पाले थे वो भी हिरना मांगो बोल रहे थे बिल्कुल नहीं तो फिर ऐसी क्यों बात है ये कि चक्कर है बंदा इंसान है हिरना जो आपको मरे तो फिर वो कहते हैं कैसे हिरना बड़ा ही � वो बहुत इसी साल का हिंदुओं को बोल रहे थे। फिर वो कहते हैं इसी साल आया कि बचपन में बच्चे थे वो जंगल से बच कोई रह गया बच्चा छोड़ा जा। तो बिल्यू बिल्यू का हिंदुओं ने उस बच्चे को पाल लिया। वो हिंदुओं को दौड़ने लग गया हिंदुओं को खाता सी, उन्होंने बोली बोलता सी, और उन्होंने क्यों ना था सिक्का आज क्या मार्जिन है मैंने मैंने खा लिया हर दुनिया में इस पीसी चली है चाहे बर्ड हो चाहे जानवर हो चाहे इंसान हो वो अपने जान बचाओ तो तो जाए ना तो बुरा गया कि मैं उनको मार दूँगा क्योंकि तेरे लिए चुकी हो लाये तो उस तो बात सामने के लिए पता नहीं क्यों उस तो बात क्यों जड़ी को बदल के लिए एक टीम बेचिया कि तेरा आप तेरे चुनाव लड़के ठीक है तो भी दो कंट्री तेरे चुनाव लाइन लड़के आए थे तो आज ये बहुत कुछ सालों में लड़के बोलो we salute you sir that you have studied so much about the Sikh history I salute you that our generation we have never had so such history of the Sikhs and the numbers that you have told us you are great and uh, I hope you can become a Sikh also. <laughs> if you believe in Sikh traditions, if you believe in Sikh traditions, you can also. So, we welcome you that you have come to visit our college. It's great. So, I think that you have also come to the full note, the Kuru Melayaga, for the Bhagavad Kalma. Thank you very much. Why would you have Khalsa? Because a person of world calibre, the historian, the curator, the writer, the researcher, the human rights activist, Mr. Dominic Dandovin is amongst us. Thanks to Mr. Pupinder Singh, another great alumni settled in Netherlands who had been spearheading the movement for the 
restoration and the upgradation of the Sikh dignity in the European Peninsula. At the same time, working inter-community cultural dialogues who had been working for human rights as well as the pride of Khalsa College Central in Netherlands. He has recommended Mr. Dominic. And Mr. Dominic, our community, our governing council, our all students and teachers, we are de de uh, very much de indebted to your good sir. Because you have opened the welcome doors for the Sikh community in Nepal. Tracing the history of the supreme sacrifices of the Sikh soldiers who had fought for all communities, who had fought for humanity in Lipur, in Gallipoli. Super work you had done for the community. Bringing the Indian and the Belgian communities together, creating a bond of friendship by your historic writings and research papers. Inspiration for all of us, for our students and our teachers. And today when we are celebrating, commemorating the centenary anniversary 24th and 25th of April throughout the world, commemorizing the supreme sacrifices of the six soldiers, our forefathers, who have fought valiantly for the dignity of the Sikh community, drawing the great inspiration from Sri Guru Hargobind Sahib, with whose blessing we are here as students, as teachers, as members. Without his blessing, it would not have been possible. Keeping the traditions alive, keeping the historic six traditions alive is the greater thing which every Sikh has.